Old lefties getting into bed with the CIA does seem to be one of the more curious legacies of the Cold War. What did the CIA have in common with the likes of Jackson Pollock? I don't look at Jackson Pollock and see in those random splurgy lines um, a metaphor for the great rugged individualism of the United States of America. That's not what I see, but that's what the CIA wanted me to see and the audiences to see. Bizarrely, what's happening is that the CIA identify an American, an absolutely quintessentially American movement in aesthetics, which is being derided at home in America. And they decide, as a result of that, to, to protect it, to nurture it, to promote it and to export it abroad as a carrier for a positive idea about America and American freedom. Abstract Expressionism is often seen as the quintessential movement of modern painting, but there's a deep puzzle about it. How did its angst-ridden, dysfunctional artists, products of the deeply alienated urban scene, come to be used as servants of empire? 1945, and as Western armies sweep across Germany, voices crackle on the field radios, speaking in English and in Russian until finally those allied in the struggle come together on the River Elbe. For Europe and the world, an unforgettable moment. And if only all had continued to act in the spirit of that moment, what a Europe, what a world might then have emerged. Well, so, you, you know, the United States has, has saved Europe, uh, but so has the Soviet Union. You've got to remember that, that it was the Soviet Union that, without the Soviet Union, Hitler could not have been defeated. And the Soviet Union and Uncle Joe, the avuncular Uncle Joe image, has been built up very carefully by European, especially British, propagandists. Mm. Um, and then that all has to be dismantled after the war because he's now the avowed enemy. Already it was evident that the Europe of 1939 had gone forever. The annexation of the Baltic states, the huge advances of the Red Armies had placed enormous areas of Eastern Europe under Soviet domination. In the economic chaos of this post-war period, communism saw its greatest chance. Wherever there was dissatisfaction, there they could fan the flames of revolt. If you think about the opening phase of the, of the Cold War, culture is terribly important. The weapons have been stood down for the time being. The two sides are looking at each other, you know, over the fence. And, and what they, they are fighting with initially, and it lasts the whole way through the Cold War, and in fact, I would argue is the central sort of um, theater of the Cold War, they're fighting with culture. And the thing you have to remember about the CIA is that there was a group of uh, Ivy League educated, quote unquote, liberal thinkers, intellectuals, people who could otherwise have been staffing, you know, the boards of universities and, and philanthropic foundations, and often there was a sort of enormous crossover between the two. And these people had a very um, sophisticated idea about modern art and modernism and what was happening in America. It starts initially really as a response to internal domestic arguments against modern art as something that's left wing, incomprehensible, repugnant where uh, publicly you have congressmen on the floor of Congress denouncing it as um, commie-inspired, un-American, uh, a deliberate and perhaps even treasonous effort to subvert American values. So 
If the American public have been asked, do you want to fund uh, exhibitions of abstract expressionism abroad, uh, we, we would know what the answer would have been at that well, time. Yeah, the answer was no, because they did yeah. try it. Mm. And it was, you know, famously, a show called Advancing American Art in 1946 got as far as Paris, I think, and then it was so widely denounced at home that it had to be cancelled and 95% of the exhibits were sold off f for nothing, peanuts. And this is, a, this is the moment where it becomes clear that America's official... Um, institutions for doing this, the State Department, has no Ministry of Culture as such, but you know, the State Department with its international programs, they can't touch it, it's toxic, which is why the CIA, together with their consortium, which includes principally the Museum of Modern Art, but also a great big sort of cultural front that's set up in Europe called the Congress for Cultural Freedom, this is when they step in. You know, when I spoke to one of the guys who'd sort of spearheaded this for the CIA, who'd really sort of come up with a formula for how to use abstract expressionism as a vehicle for the Pax Americana, for America's presence, benign presence in the world, um, he said, you know, we had to, you know, if we'd done this openly, we would have had to shut it down. So the only way to do it, to advance freedom of expression, was to do it covertly and secretly. Tell us how they did it exactly. What what did they do? They did well. What the, so there's quite a few people working at the CIA, including the man who's heading up this um, international organisations division. It's called a guy called Tom Braden, who's impeccably connected. He's worked for intelligence in the Second World War. He's an academic. He works for Nelson Rockefeller at the Museum of Modern Art after the Second World War, and then is recruited to the CIA. He is the kind of, um, I would say, kingpin. Mm. So essentially it's the CIA, Tom Braden and his division, um, the Museum of Modern Art, particularly its international programme, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which is, a, a, as I said, uniquely a CIA creation, which is based in Paris, with huge funds, and has access to the major galleries of every major capital in, in Western Europe. Some people have said to me when I've been talking about this, they say it's interesting that the CIA make better art critics than most of the art critics at the time, because in a sense they see this coming and they back it before anyone else does. OK, you can make claims, and critics did make claims, that this is the new great American painting, but I wonder how plausible they would have been. Why would you have not fixed on something which had identifiable subject matter, indeed American subject matter, you know, Edward Hopper or something of this sort. I mean, if it was Hopper, it would be socialist realism, sort of. Sort of. Um, or social realism, let's call it. But social realism is quite close to what they're doing in the Soviet Union. And what, and what the Soviet Union is denouncing, which it, what it loves to hate, is, is abstract expressionism. So it's worth supporting in the CIA's mind just because the Soviets hate it. This is an opportunity with characters like Pollock to make modernism, to make the story of modern art an American story. And, and Pollock, by the way, is, is the hero who impersonates the nation. He comes in, you know, like some kind of screen cowboy through the bar doors at the Cedar Tavern and says, you know, I can paint better than anyone. And, and they get this perfect um, character self-directed, individualistic, almost anti-establishment character. And that's what they're saying. That's what they're saying to the rest of the world. Do you want, do you want to be Shostakovich in the Soviet Union, where they're telling you, you know, whether you should, how you should look? We want our Shostakovich to look optimistic, they say at one point. Can you imagine? Shostakovich, who's completely depressed by the situation he's in. They have Pollock. Is this America's greatest living artist? The moment Henry Luce and the Time Life Empire, which are fantastically called Warrior, are brought on side, and they are specifically uh, targeted. Henry Luce has a position where he says, uh, much like Truman, you know, these are ham and egg men. I mean, they're, 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 it's insulting, crazy, nutty people who should be sent back to the nut house, talking about abstract expressionists. He gets a letter, a sharp sort of letter, from uh, someone at the Museum of Modern Art, and indeed from various CIA people who he knows, saying, no, 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 you've got it all wrong. Can you not, can you and your publications not sort of turn this round and, and uh, support this? And then suddenly you get this time life spread on Pollock. Mm. 
this idea that this man uh, who's struggling with alcohol and and chucking cans of paint round in a studio that's falling apart somewhere in the Hamptons, the idea that he is becomes the cherished vessel of American freedom, of the official, if secret, idea of American liberal freedom is is so fantastic you wouldn't credit it. You know, you just wouldn't think it's possible. But that's that's what happens, and that's why the, the CIA thinking is very sophisticated. The money trail is quite complicated. You have a series of pipelines coming from the CIA, hidden pipelines, which go to front organisations. Uh, there was one I found, a foundation that was based in Miami called the Miami District Fund. When you look at their accounts, because of course the weak spot in all of this was there were wires hanging out the back of the radio. When people like me went off and looked at the tax returns of some of these charities, official charities which were required by law to mm. send tax returns in, you'd find these uh, um, discrepancies or anom anomalies. So you, you had this Miami District Fund uh, put some money, $10,000, into an art exhibition that was sponsored by the Congress for Cultural Freedom in Paris. And then there was another one based in Dallas, which was, uh, which declared that its that its um, interests were chi chiefly in sort of you know for handicapped people in the local area, who are also spent thousands of dollars on on some kind of cultural adventure, in in Europe. And and that's when you realise these are pass throughs. They're dummy. They're, they're real foundations or charities, but they're being used as pass throughs. You piggyback several times over. And those those methods were explained to me by Tom Braden and other. CIA people that I spoke to. New York in particular, but America was now the center, the self-designated center of modern art in the world. And you cannot be uh, great politically without great art. That's the model. That's the model that the CIA were following. You cannot be Venice without Tintoretto. You cannot be Florence without Giotto. You cannot be New York without Pollock. That's what I'm saying, I'm not saying Pollock's to blame, I'm not saying that he was complicit, I'm not saying that that has anything to do with what was going on in Pollock's head when he was, or his soul, when he was making those paintings. And I'm not saying that when you look at one, there's a CIA man behind the, you know, behind a bush somewhere telling you how to respond to it. I'm simply saying that the way in which it emerges into the sort of public consciousness across the world at a time when nobody else had any money to move this stuff around and to give it this kind of backing, that is historically linked to a Cold War, ideas about propaganda and, and psychological forms of persuasion. And it's, it's, it's a fact. That's a fact. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy fact, because we know from the documentation, from the interviews that have been done, that this is what the CIA did.